No, I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is Ohio State great and host of The Morning Juice and Off Campus. It is Bobby Carpenter. Bobby, you've had uh, about, what is it, like 10 weeks now to, to recover from the Cotton Bowl. Have you fully recovered from that? Or was Ohio State losing to Mizzou in that fashion perhaps just not as painful because non-playoff New Year's Six games for Ohio State is just really doesn't shape a whole lot of perception? Like, what's what's been the the recovery from that? Well, I think initially it was it was very painful, and people were very upset about it, and nobody cares about the game. Like, oh, you know, guys don't want to play in it, this and that. And then people only care when it looks bad and you get beat probably in a certain way. And then all of a sudden the game matters, even though it didn't matter before that. And so I, I do think that the way that it went down did impact some people and impacted a lot of folks. And I think that, honestly, it probably jump-started some things to get going internally at Ohio State and a little bit maybe on the NIL front. Um, and then to maybe take a hard, good, hard, long look at stuff. And, you know, when you, you're starting quarterbacks not out there, you're juggled your offensive line. And so there was a lot of, obviously, negativity surrounding that, and people were really upset. And then all of a sudden that kind of spearheaded some changes on the coaching staff. You know, you bring in Chip Kelly. I think that that's a, obviously a huge addition. Uh, Matt Greary comes in, to, you know, it was with Jim Knowles earlier comes back from Indiana to help with the uh, coaching the safeties now. And then the addition of James Laurinaitis, which took a little bit of time, but you know, ultimately he gets promoted from a graduate assistant to a full-time coach, even though he was running the linebackers last year, like those things like that felt really good. And so on the player side and then going, you know, into the transfer portal, Kyle McCord leaves, you bring in Will Howard and, you know, Kyle McCord, like everybody, it's, it's kind of a complex relationship here because, I don't think he's a bad player. He obviously isn't, you know, CJ Stroud or Justin Fields. And like, that's okay too. Like you can be just a good college quarterback, you know, as far as maybe, you know, personality wise, there's a lot of pressure on him. And I don't know if he really responded all that well to it, but you bring in a guy who's won a big 12 championship, you know, who's been in that situation before he feels good about it. You get, you know, this manna from heaven with you know, Quinshawn Jukins coming in. And you know, I don't think they're even really looking for a running back. And all of a sudden you have a guy who led the SEC for a couple of years, like, Hey, uh, I'd like to come up there. David, Davidson, Nick news. Like I like him. And he says it's a good place to play. And I don't want to get into maybe why he left. Uh, that's, you can bring in, bring someone on from Ole Miss Connor, and talk about that, but you throw him in. Then all of a sudden, like the saving thing happens. And you get Caleb Downs, who's maybe the best safety in the country, who has a couple seasons left. Uh, you get Seth McLaughlin, the center, who you know everybody bemoans the national championship game. But yeah. you don't start 26 games at Alabama center and not be a good player. And sometimes, like, that's just a bad fit and things got a little sideways. And then you get Julian Sane coming in with the Bill O'Brien hiring. And then you move that to then Chip Kelly, who – People have differing opinions on both of those guys, and I. But I think it really works. Is Ryan's former head coach? He coached under him. He played under him. The guy's obviously been successful in college and in the NFL to a degree. He's been a head coach. He has all those ties, and so he's a guy you can trust. If you're Ryan, you can let him be the offensive coordinator, and that's really all Chip wants to do. Like you don't have to worry about a guy looking for other jobs, knowing that, hey man, being a head coach at a place that doesn't maybe have the resources that align with expectations, that job stinks because it's almost impossible to get it done. And then the final piece of this, Connors, I know it got a little long-winded, is you had a lot of guys who could have left. And outside of Marvin Harrison Jr., which I think everybody understood that he was going to be on his way out, everybody else really came back of note. Mike Hall left, and there was some other stuff going on with him. Um you know, I think outside of just him needing him, probably more needing to go. But a lot of the guys come back, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And so you had this confluence of events over maybe like the following four to five weeks where everybody was really upset. And then all of a sudden, like, man, things look really good. Can't wait to see him in spring ball. This is about as good a situation as we could possibly have now. One thing I do like about Ryan Day and really appreciate is that he understands that at Ohio State, that anything short of getting to a playoff, winning a national championship, 
like you can make those adjustments and bringing in Jim Knowles when he did, I applauded that move because a lot of others in his situation with the timing of that would have said, ah, no, let's, let's dig our heels in even more. And so this, this 10 week period that has all happened right after losing the way that they did to Mizzou, it's fascinating because everything has changed. And now it feels like Ohio state is this ultimate agent of chaos. That's what I've been calling them because I think they're the only non sec team that can win a national championship this year. Like I, I truly do. Like, and look, that can depend on a lot of different things, but how unique does this offseason feel knowing that this is as close to any team that I've seen in recent memory where it truly feels like title or bust for a head coach? One thing to be title or bust for a specific team, for a specific program, but for a head coach in the way that we talk about Ryan Day. You know, everybody always looks at this where, you know, is it a failure if you don't win a national championship? And I would say that's definitely the expectation, and it's probably kind of the expectation most years, realistically, at Ohio State, like it is, you know, probably a handful of other schools. And Ryan would always say, like, at Ohio State, your job is to win all your games, especially the last regular season one, and win a national championship. And, like, that's kind of what people expect. So he's leaned into that. You know, he understands that. I wouldn't say it's a failure for this team, but I think it would be kind of unfulfilled expectations if they're not at least playing for it. Now, understand this is a new era in the CFP where it's a little bit more March Madness-esque, where it's not just winning two games. You've got to win a handful now. And so, as you know, the more time you add in more games, injuries, you know, maybe some weather. play. Like, there's just a lot of a, a bad call here or there. Um, you know, there, there's things that can impact it. So I, I don't necessarily want to go like all the way Tyler Buss, but this team, Ryan knows it. The, the coaches have seen it. Like the players, they've been around it. Like they know how much talent's here. They know that this is, they have the ability to win it. And you look at the odds makers and everything else, and it's just a function of, hey, go out here. Now you have to perform. And so I think guys enjoy that pressure because you'd rather have that pressure with the talent than without. And so they've got all that before them. But I think there is a real feel where like, there shouldn't be anybody in the country that's markedly better than you. And so it's going out there and winning those games. I know you're a Ryan Day believer, but if, 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 if the Ohio State job were to open up, let's just say hypothetically, and that, that hay is in the barn, it, it, which, look, that's not a foregone conclusion, even with Ross Bjork stepping in. I think he very much wants to make his first splashy football coach hire. I think that's something that, that he would like to be able to do at a place like Ohio State. But if it opens up, I think you can make a case that it's the best job in the sport. I'm usually not that who's like, oh, is this job better than this job? Because timing impacts so much of that. But man, for the last 20, 25 years, you could really make that good argument. Have you even allowed yourself to, to go there and think about potential candidates? Because I think that list would be far and wide and it would be incredible. I think it would. Um, I mean, like you said, I'm, I'm a little biased. I think it probably is the best job in college football. There are some drawbacks to it. I mean, there's the pressure element of it. Um, and I know Cincinnati, I guess, just, you know, they're joining the Big 12. Now they're, you know, a power four school or whatever it is. But you know, for the longest time, it was the biggest football-centric state that had one elite program or one power five program in state. You know, and you look at, you know, Bama and it's all, Alabama with Auburn and Alabama. You look at Georgia, Georgia Tech's in there. And, you know, I mean, Georgia Tech isn't what Alabama or Georgia was, but, I mean, they've won a national title within the last 30-some years. And they've been playing at a very – they played at a high level points. Michigan has Michigan State. You know, Florida's got, obviously, a, a number of schools, you know, that, that play football at a high level. So it, it, it has the second large – or the seventh largest population by state, and it's 11 million people. And I always joke and say 10, of them, 10 million of them care about Ohio State football. With that comes a lot of resources – but also comes a lot of pressure. And so you've got to be able to win and have success. So I, I do believe that it's one of the best jobs and probably the best job in college football, in my opinion. Um, I think Ryan understands and appreciates what it is. Uh, you know, I, Ross Dork coming in, I'm pretty excited. I think Ryan's excited too uh, for him to be there because he, I think he gets it and him being a lot of places. I mean, hopefully he doesn't want to make a splash higher prematurely. You know, it's, it's great if you can be a, an AD and, have your coach win national championships and you know maybe you get the credit maybe you don't on that tangentially even though he wasn't you know quote your your hire when you got there 
Uh, but I've been excited with Ross being here and everything that he's you know, kind of brought to the table. He's going to have to hire a men's basketball coach, so that's going to be part of it. So we'll have that. <laughs> this is literally his first order of business of how that's going uh, to ultimately look. But, you know, he he's understands the way a lot of things work. And so I, I think Ryan's excited for that. I'm excited. But, yeah, there's there's a number of you know, candidates I think you would have. There should be there would be a lot of people that I think would like the job. And it's it's wholly unique. And as you mentioned, over 25 years, um, you know, and you could even make the argument back to all the way to um, 19, whatever it was, 51, I think, when Woody got the job. Like every coach that's coached here on a permanent basis is in the in the College Football Hall of Fame you know, for what they've been able to do. And, you know, John Cooper got close to winning national titles, came up a little short. Um, you know, uh, Earl Bruce played for some, didn't win them. Tress won one, or played for a couple, Urban in the same spot. Like, they really haven't missed on, an, on a hire since World War II. And that, that's something that's special, and that, that's a tribute to the ADs. So, like, while well, Ross, like, you want to make that splash hire, you also don't want to be the first guy that hires someone that maybe flames out in three or four right. years. Yeah. Yeah. LSU is the only other place I can think of like that, where you talk about that in-state dynamic and it's like, it's, it's oh, yeah. the program. It's very true. Yeah. And, and, it, and it elevates, it elevates the job so much. You're, you're exactly right. Like I, I think there, I do think there's something to be said for that. It's fantastic. And one of the things with LSU, like Saban kind of woke it up I and mean, there was a period there where you kind of look around and uh, you know, for about 15, 20 years, like they just, they, they just weren't as good as they probably should have been. Not that they were ever like bad, but you see since that time, their last three coaches have all won national championships. Ohio State's the only other school that has the ability to match that should Ryan win one. To have three consecutive coaches win national titles, that means you've got a lot of advantages going for you, but also means you've hired well. And so those two things are very, very difficult to align. What's been your impression of Chip Kelly so far? A, a little different than what I expected. You know, you get used to seeing a guy as a head coach. And I think he kind of turned into Bill Belichick a little bit at the podium. And you've just, you're getting beat up. People are getting upset with you because you're maybe, he was trying to do it differently, especially in the NFL. So you get a little surly with it. And at UCLA, when you've got 10,000 people coming to your games and you've got like a good team. It's not like you're rolling a four and eight team out there. You're competing at a high level. You're ranked most of the time. You beat USC, your crosstown rival. And you're not getting any support. And so I think that just wears on you a little bit as the head coach. But he's very quick-witted. He's, like, funny. He's engaging. He seems like a guy who literally is like, you know what? Now I'm coaching because I want to coach again. Like, I'm, I'm enjoying my job. You get into this stuff, and eventually you get promoted in life if you're good at what you do to becoming more administration than anything else. And that's essentially what a head coach now in college is. Like, you've got to handle your NIL. You've got to be involved in this. You're fundraising. You're – your player's counselor when they want to leave and they want more money or they want, they got to figure out all these different things. And all of a sudden now, like, well, I can just go back to coaching quarterbacks and drawing up plays and handling that side. I've got a guy as my head coach who lets me do it, who trusts me. Like he seems like a guy who took a sigh, a deep sigh of relief, a nice big breath. And when he's very engaging in his interviews, he's been engaging in the Woody Hayes been awesome to deal with heck he's on McAfee like cracking jokes like just yeah. he's, he's a fun guy and I don't think anybody really saw that side of him probably for the last decade yeah it is it is crazy to think about that dynamic because it approaches everything if ego is going to get in the way then obviously those two can can butt heads in the relationship that they have that'll that'll go out the window in a hurry but if if that approach is there man that, what a what a whale of a hire that would be uh for Ryan Day is Will Howard going to be QB1? Because, you know, you see Devin Brown have the, the comments where he's like, you know, people that are saying, like, I'm going to go in the portal. You know, they're all cowards. They live in their mom's basement. <laughs> I, I love the fire. I get it. Like, you're, you're backed into a corner. This is your time to fight right now, not necessarily in fall. But uh, are you surprised that there has been a little bit of more of – there's been, at least from my standpoint, more discourse about the starting job and that it's not a default that Will Howard is going to win it? Well, I – I mean, you looked last year, there was a quarterback battle with Devin Brown. And, like, the more you've played in a system and the more you just play in general, you're going to gain experience. And, unfortunately, Devin got hurt in the Cotton Bowl because I was excited, excited to kind of see what he could potentially do. Um, I'll tell you this, in the first couple practices, everyone has looked pretty good. Like, 
there haven't been any balls that I would say like, ah, it wasn't great. And, you know, part of last year, there was a lot of inconsistencies. And there was some of that this year. Like, I would anticipate that Will Howard would be the starter. I would say that that's the, that's the safe money right now. But I don't think it's this situation where, you know, it's like Will at, you know, one to three, and then your next odds are like five to one, eight to one, 20 to one. Like, I think that it's a lot tighter, especially with Devin Brown. And Ryan's just not going to give a guy a job. Like, your job as the head coach is to make sure your team is in the best position to win. And also remember this, like, as a transfer guy, and that's why I always give Joe Burrow a ton of credit when he went to LSU. You're integrating a team that already has pre-built relationships and preconceived notions about guys. And Devin Brown is a very popular guy. He's a hard worker. He's charismatic. Like the guy you heard spouting off you know, in a press conference, like, you think I'm just going to walk away because there's people saying I shouldn't have the job? And, you know, saying a lot of things that kind of a lot of times many players think and they just don't verbalize it in a, in a media session. So, like, he's endeared himself to this team. And so if you're a head coach, you just can't give a guy a job because there's an old saying like in the NFL, like you can't fool the room and you've got it. Like Will Howard's got to be better than Devin Brown. And like, honestly, like Lincoln Keenholz, I know he's thrown in the cotton bowl, but I don't think he was anticipating you know, that, that whole situation playing out the way it did. But I mean, these guys, they're going to push, they're going to push really hard. You've got a couple of really good freshmen there. And the challenge for Ryan is just to try to make sure you can have a competition while you're still developing these guys in a similar offense, but with a new OC, integrating some new players into the team, making sure everybody's getting enough reps with all the right groups to be able to adequately judge them. Because players will see all that too. Like, you know, this isn't really a competition. This guy isn't getting the reps or he isn't getting this opportunity. And so to make sure that this is fair, they're all getting equal opportunities. And then as they play better, then maybe you start to parcel it out and things begin to move. But it has to be obvious. And when it's not, that's when it's really hard for a coach because then you have to start making projections and people have to kind of believe and believe it with you. And if guys struggle, that's when those, those doors open for criticism. I just want Devin Brown to change his number. That's it. That's all I want. Man. You, and, you and a bunch of other people. Connor, you're not alone in saying that, especially quarterbacks. They hate the 33. And I know it's the Sammy Baugh tribute. It just looks weird. I was number 33 in high school. So my one year of playing freshman football, and then I got hurt my sophomore year and didn't play. So I love the number 33. Like, don't get it twisted. But there's just a certain confirmation bias that comes with it. You can't struggle and be number 33 quarterback. You just can't. I get I, I get it. But, you know, to each their own. Um, has Hester given you the rundown of how ridiculous Quinshawn Judkins is? Has, has he told you about that? Um, he's alluded to it a little bit. And okay. I mean, the guy's incredibly intelligent. Like he had some brief conversations. He, I mean, maybe he opens up. He isn't a guy that you know seems like, you know, overly gregarious with his personality. He seems like he's business and gets after things. He's a, he's been a beast in the weight room. They haven't put pads on yet. It's just been shells the first couple of days. But I mean, I've watched some of his film. And when I was like, this guy wants to come to Ohio State. Like he does know that they have Travion Henderson. So it's not like he's going to get, you know, 400 carries, but I think the fact that he came there, Trey was good with him coming. Both of those guys saying, Hey, we'd rather each have like 200 than like load up now with another 400. It's better for the longevity of our career. It can speak to kind of the person that he is, but he's, he's a smart guy too. I think he got into Yale. Like he's, he's pretty much the total package from what I understand. Yeah, the only only thing you uh, might might have to to you know I, I don't want to say deal with, but yeah, the miles on those legs. That's the only thing I wonder about, like the, the type of contact he takes on. So you know, had a ton of carries in high school at Pike Road, but the player itself, I mean, the guy is the guy is incredible. Some peak Maurice Claret vibes, a little bit. Yeah, some some shades of that. Claret's one of those guys that I just wish he could have been able to exist in this current NIL world that we're in because obviously his career plays out a lot differently if that's the case for those who didn't get to see him be an absolute monster you know at his at in his prime can you just describe how incredible he was before things went off the rails for him so we're, we're the same class coming in I remember telling my dad we were doing like some different bag drills and like chase drills and like competition stuff one versus one and, you know, so I was Asian and I were lifting partners. Then Maurice was kind of the third guy. He was the third dude in our group. And so we'd always try to go against each other. I remember how strong he was. He was just a vocal guy challenging everybody. He had like the big personality. And I don't know if he was maybe the top, like fastest top end guy you're going to find. But like his change of direction and explosion 
for a guy that was six foot, like 230 pounds, and his quads were like Jim Brown's out there, I remember telling my dad, I'm like, this is what college football is like. like I don't know if I can tackle a guy like that, like consistently. I'm like, we go against each other. He is so stinking quick and it's so much pop. And you should see him when he hits dudes. Like, he has so much power and force behind him. It, it's just remarkable. And so for anybody, like you go back and watch that 20, 2002 and some of his highlights of what he did during that season. I mean, they do that great vision, great explosions, like a force of nature. I think Judkins, I don't know if he has quite the, the size because it's a different game now, but he has better top end than that. But he is a physical runner, man. It possesses some of those same skills. Yeah, it's every once in a while you just gotta you just gotta watch Youngstown Boys at thirty for thirty and just just dial into that because it, it is incredible. You know, it just kind of makes you wonder, man, how how what what could have happened had he been able to to kind of follow that that trajectory that that we saw from him as a true freshman. How do you feel about the the NIL discussions that are being had? Because on one hand, it's great that you know we see guys and Ohio State's been a popular topic of this of this conversation as well with these guys who are getting those deals lined up and it's great and you know Jackson Dart who's Judkins former teammate he's got a a private jet deal now I mean like at the other on the other side of it though you you kind of wonder you know how how would you handle dealing with all these distractions like can you put yourself in that position of thinking about how you would have handled that as like an 18 19 20 year old kid so it's interesting like usually there is a positive correlation between in life between wealth and age, meaning as you get older, you get wealthier. What's unique about athletics, and maybe it's the same like entertainers and things, but they usually have more guardrails around them, is like it used to be get drafted 21, 22, you'd get a pot of cash. And it's like, hey, manage this now. And like, well, I don't have 40 years of experience of working. It's not like I'm a 50-year-old man who's finally made all this money. So it's, it was a different situation. So these guys now, like they're more attuned to things. They're more business savvy than ever before. A lot of t- coaches and programs do a good job of bringing people in to talk to them ar- about it. And that's, I get a chance to go over there and work out with the guys. And that's mostly what a lot of the conversations are about. Yeah, sure. Like playing tips here or there, but it's, it's really more just kind of handle life and everything that you're experiencing. And they're getting it younger than ever before. And so making sure you have positive influences around you. The people that are in it are in it for the right things. You know, hopefully you have a family that's like that. If you don't, it's like, hey, I, I know a lot of guys who are business partners of mine. Like, there, there are people here that can help you, that want to get you involved in positive things, that want to pour into you and invest into you as a person. And so, like, it, it's hard. It's really hard to see that because they're trying to do that while playing, while playing college football. But then also, like, you're still going to class. You still have commitments outside of just practice and meetings. So there's a lot to juggle. And I'll never like besmirch it. I think it's awesome. My dad played 10 years and he was like, man, is he upset that guys make this much money today? I'm like, no, like he's like, great. Good for them. And I've tried to always like be positive with that. Like, Hey, just cause we didn't have, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't be happy that someone else does. So I'm really happy for those guys. The only thing that I worry about with this, and it's, it's the confluence of the transfer portal and, um, NIL coming together. Like I believe guys should always try to get their best there, get your market value. But there does come a time where like you have to make decisions. Is it always about the dollar or is it about growth and development? And like trying to balance those and to make sure like just because you're not playing somewhere, maybe you could get a little more money somewhere else and maybe play more early. But is that ultimately the best thing for your career and your development? And it's a little bit of the Nick Saban conversation of, hey man, like get good. And then everything comes with that. Not how much am I going to play and how much am I going to make? And if you focus and if you inverse the order of those, it can have a detrimental impact on guys because there needs to be an understanding of sacrifice of work, delayed gratification. Like those things are all traits that are admirable and it just are admirable. And it just takes time sometimes to get there and everybody's impatient. And so that's just what I worry about player development as like a human being and if you can't handle it in college, I'm going to tell you right now, I tell you, the next level, it is far more unforgiving. And as you look at guys that you know, Mac Jones just got traded down to Jacksonville, Florida for a sixth round draft pick when he was, you know, a first round pick and started last year, like, the league can turn on you quick. And so, like, learning to handle those adversities, I think, is paramount. What was your best? best deal when you were in the NF when you were in the NFL was it just being a part of the Dallas Cowboys I assume there's just like extra money that comes with that you don't even have to do like commercials or anything 
uh, I mean, I did some small stuff. Like, honestly, I tell people the most money that I probably ever made, and I would say it's probably true for a lot of the guys in my class, uh, like AJ and Schlegel and myself, like, you play linebacker. I mean, it's not like you're an offensive guy. It's not a super sexy position. Now, Dallas is a big market, and, yeah, you'd be able to make stuff and get your Nike deal and stuff like that. But, like, doing appearances and signings, because you couldn't do it during college. So from the January to May after the season, I mean, that's, I probably made more money in that time off the field doing stuff and appearances and all these different things and speaking engagements than I ever did any other, any other time in my career. And like that, <laughs> my agent to the point where he's like, our marketing guys, like, don't tell anybody else what you're doing because this doesn't happen at other schools. So just make sure they'll, they'll expect me to do this. I was getting this done and I kind of served as my own rep with it and just gauging the market and figuring that stuff out. But it was, I mean, it was a lot, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity and then being able to kind of continue that stuff, even being a 40-year-old guy and going and doing professional development, speaking work, and things like that. I mean, those things have kind of continued today. You realize that if you and AJ had been allowed to make NIL money, you guys are both on a head and shoulders commercial. Oh, yeah. We would have, I mean, there would have been a lot of cool stuff like that and and fun stuff, but honestly, man, like, I – and this is where like the jealousy thing comes in. I don't know if I would have been emotionally mature enough to be able to deal with it. And I'm, I say that with a lot of certainty. Um, you know, I dated my wife for a couple of years in college. Um, we dated a year or two out and then got married when I was playing. Like if all that stuff would have been like thrown at you early on, like, I mean, I'd like to think it's like, Hey, I'm going in, I'm going to work. I'm going to stay humble. And yeah, I would have worked out with AJ and we would have continued to grind and work hard. But I don't know if like the way you view adverse situations would have been the same. And I don't know if I would have been able to handle stuff when you're given so much early on. Not that you didn't work for it. I, I honestly couldn't tell you if my career and really my life would have turned out the way that it ultimately did. It's easy to just add, add some money to the bank account and assume everything would have stayed the same. But yeah, you just, you just money, don't know. I tell guys, money and opportunity, like it, it, may, it opens the decision base for you. Like it gives you more options. And that's a gr- options are a great thing when you choose the right ones. But there's a lot of bad ones too. And trying to mitigate that, Connor, it's, it's tough. And that's what, with these guys, I, they're very mature, much more than I was when I was probably 20, 20, 21 years old. But it's still hard and you can still make some missteps along the way. Last one for you. Uh, let's speak into the crystal ball. If we're having a, a state of the Buckeyes conversation at this time next year, where is the program? National champs, searching for a new coach, somewhere <laughs> in between, beating Michigan maybe? What, what does it look like? Oh, I love the two options. I'm fully binomial here, like new coach, national championship. Like that's it. Um, I, I would have said that for certain this team would be in the playoff. I would ho- – I'm – of a strong belief, they'll have won the conference. Um, you know, Oregon coming in, they're going to be good. Penn State, I think, is going to be a lot better. Uh, I would have said they will have played for a national championship. Like, that's, I believe that this team has the ability to get there. And I believe they have the ability to win it. Um, it I just, I hate saying, say, if that's the case, kind of feel that good about it. I mean, they're not like, they're favorites, but it's not like overwhelming favorites. I mean, I might throw it throw some shekels on them today and maybe I will, but I'm not willing to put like my, my kids 529s on them or anything like that quite yet. Uh, as I wouldn't for any school to tell you the truth. No 2024 Ohio state national championship tattoo for you just yet. We'll hold off on that. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait and be patient on that. Um, and then the other thing too, is like it, people start spouting off. I try to be overly critical, try to look at things and be critical of the moment, maybe not of the person in the whole situation, and I hate like throwing things out crazy for expectations because it's publicity is like poison. I know it only kills you if you swallow it, but it just puts a lot of pressure on guys and probably undue pressure that when I was playing, you didn't have form- avenues for former players to get up on a podium and spew nonsense. So I try sure. not to spew a lot of nonsense, Connor. Yeah, you can spew some nonsense at some point down the road here. You'll have plenty of opportunities, no doubt. Bobby, this has been great, man. Really appreciate it. We'll do this again soon. My pleasure, sir. Anytime.